Okay, you guys are live, so you're ready to start whenever you're ready. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Jack from the Financial Times, and it's a great pleasure to uh, help moderate our next uh, session over the coming uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, so we have a great panel, and our focus is around the idea of unleashing impact research into action. So looking at academic research that's, of course, rigorous, but also has or delivers policy and practice. And we're going to explore then uh, over the coming minutes, both some great individual prize winning examples of that in practice, but then also the wider structural challenges. What more can be done by individual researchers? What are the barriers within and beyond their own academic institutions that need to be tackled? And what sort of initiatives could help really roll out meaningful, societally impactful uh, insights in practice, in teaching and in policy? So I'm joined here by uh, Daniel Garrett from the University of Pennsylvania and Mark Durand from the University of Cambridge, both of whom were winners in the Financial Times' Responsible Business Education Awards, which is an annual award. And then we have two other um, award winners, Sarah Kaplan from the University of Toronto, who was an awardee of the Responsible Research in Management Award, and Srinivas uh, Venugopal from the University of Vermont, uh, an award winner also at the RIBM and the American Marketing Association. So welcome, welcome all the panelists and a reminder to all of you who are watching, do please use already from now on the Q&A function to ask any questions and we'll try to certainly get to those in the second half of our conversation and perhaps earlier if there are some particular specific responses to any of our panelists uh, discussions. Um, and we'll wrap up just after the hour. So let me turn um, first to, to a round of brief uh, opening remarks from our, our four panelists to just understand, in essence, the core of their work that led to these awards and what impact in the world of practice or policy it's had up till now. So maybe let me start with you, Daniel, uh, Daniel Garrett from the University of Pennsylvania, please. Hey, thank you so much, Andrew, for the, the wonderful introduction. And thank you to the organizers from, from Prime for putting this really wonderful panel together. It's been nice to, to get to know the other speakers a little bit. Uh, so my name is Daniel Garrett. I uh, sit with a finance group and I'm an economist by training. My research has been on the anti-ESG movement within the US and the associated financial costs. So um, I, I started this, this line of work with a paper about uh, the US state of Texas, which has had a series of anti-ESG laws that they passed in 2021. Um, and I started trying to look at what is the financial impact of these uh, laws just at a very, very surface level. What is the impact of these anti-ESG laws on the state budget and on the, the financial costs that local governments have to, to um, expend in order to get the resources they need? So a lot of how this kind of took place was through um, controlling what banks were able to participate in the Texas market and saying that if you're a bank and you have a policy that says we don't want to invest in oil and gas in the long run or, or we don't want to uh, give loans to companies that, that uh, engage in certain types of manu uh, firearm manufacturing or selling, um, so banks have all of these sorts of policies and then Texas came out and said if you're a bank with these sorts of policies you can't participate in certain financial markets in our state um, so I documented that this had a pretty uh, substantial impact on the banks and as well as on the state um, and really raised costs for the state as several banks left the state and, and very large important international banks in particular left the state um, or left certain markets in the state um, so I'll leave it there for, for other people to also uh, um, to keep going around that's great. Thanks very much. So, so perhaps Mark next from from Cambridge. Tell us a bit about your work. Well, thanks, Andrew. And let me first of all add my thanks to Daniel. You know, to everyone who's helped organize this. Um, I'm Mark Durant. I'm an organizational ethnographer, and what it means simply is that I study people the old-fashioned way by living life much like they do for long periods of time. And for the last four years, I've done this with one of the most significant, most prolific pedophile hunting groups here in the UK, and that's tied to a significant problem, which is that. You know that child sexual abuse, as many of you know, is ubiquitous around the world, but but also in in the UK um, as well as the US. In the US, one child is a claim of sexual abuse is made every nine minutes. In the UK, it's every seven minutes, and it's twenty four hours a day. 
it's a it's a horrifying reality of the world in which we live today. Widespread problem and the police by their own admission can't arrest themselves out of the problem. Citizens being aware of the inability of police to handle the problem satisfactorily, of course, have risen up and they form what they call pedophile hunting teams. And what they do is, of course, they go online, they pretend to be a child, and they then bait and publicly expose suspected predators. They are very effective in doing so. So I'll give you one example. In 2018, in 60% of the cases that came to court where pedophiles were convicted, the evidence was partly the evidence of hunters. The problem is that these public exposures, you know, it's a very medieval form of effectively humiliating suspects uh, is very, very harmful, not just for the suspects in terms of, you know, the stigma and their decision sometimes to end, to sort of, um, end their lives, um, but it also is very harmful for the families who find it very difficult to then survive the stigma that's attached to them. And it's even true if these suspects are ultimately not prosecuted or in court indeed found to be um, innocent of the charges. Um, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that police have no legal means to stop this because what they do is not illegal. Um, and given that, and given that they are effective, and given that the police have a duty to protect the public, all members of the public, it, it, it puts them in a real bind. And what makes it even worse is the fact that police and hunters don't talk, and they haven't talked for years. What they do instead is they work off assumptions they make about each other, you know, which effectively means that they caricature each other. And the, the only means the police have tried to stop hunting, which is mostly through criticizing, have completely backfired. Because what the hunters have very cleverly done is to create a system, kind of an online world that is almost entirely insulated from all criticisms. And so part of what I've tried to do with my co-authors, Jaco Locke and Adrian Marison, is to try and help police answer a very simple question, which is, why is it that hunters persist with these really extreme methods of publicly humiliating suspects? if much less harmful alternatives to keeping kids safe are available. And so, uh, yeah, so that's been four years of work. Um, but there we go. Thank you. And, and with some significant impact, Mark, in terms of uh, changes in policies by the police and, and concretely with, or even works with these vigilante groups? Yes. So, I mean, so a number of these um, well, a couple of these impacts, just very, to, to very briefly speak to them. I mean, one is that we, for the first time ever, brought together hunters and police in a single room, which has never happened before. And it spent three and a half hours, much longer than we planned, simply talking to each other and helping each other understand how complex their own worlds are and how, mostly how morally complex they are and why hunters do what they do. And it won't be any surprise that many of these hunters themselves are survivors of abuse. Um, but also, it's helped the police make much more intelligent decisions about how to respond to hunters. That's, that's based upon a much more sophisticated view of the inside life of hunting, which is a lot more complicated than the caricatures they used to work on. And at the same time, it has provided hunters with a much more sophisticated understanding of how difficult it is to police child sexual abuse. I can't go into details because it's just so much of it, but, but it's, it's made a really quite profound impact. And I'm still a member of a task force. It's a national task force, members of the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, Crime Prosecution Service, all the chiefs of police. We meet twice a year, and we've done this for more than four years now to talk about these issues. And yeah, it's that seems really helpful. Um, okay, thank, thank, thanks very much. Um, and we'll come back perhaps to some of these wider lessons in a few moments. Sarah, though, tell us a little bit more about your research and what impact you've been able to track. Great, and thank you so much uh, for uh, to the organizers and to you, uh, Andrew and the team. Uh, greetings from Toronto, which is the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm excited to talk about my research. Um, the, the award that uh, Andrew referred to is for my book, The 360 Corporation, which uh, talks about uh, all the challenges that organizations face when they are dealing with the multiple stakeholders that surround them. And a little bit different, I think, from the other awardees, this book was actually emerged out of my teaching. So I teach a course called the 360 Corporation. I've worked with my students now for over 15 years um, where we dive deep into one company and we look at what it looks like to deal with consumers, with communities, 
uh, with environmental issues, uh, with employee needs and things like that. And the the book emerged because I then had got questions from my students and I had to find answers. And so I went into the literature and sought out what answers we have from rigorous scholarly research and put it together in a book that was really meant for practitioners. So the the design of the book was really to take what we know from research and actually translate it into language, into storytelling that could uh, have an impact on research. The big ideas being that trade-offs are there. There, you know, people would like to imagine that somehow you can have that shared value, that win-win. That's the those are the ideas that are often promoted. And what the book talks about is the fact that no, often these trade-offs, either between various stakeholders and the shareholder, the bottom line, or actually amongst the different stakeholders, those trade-offs really do exist. And so the question is, how do you resolve them? And the answer that I, you know, the book talks about is uh, innovation, that it says basically we need to innovate in order to get out of, of these challenges and find new ways of, of operating. And so the book kind of pushes research out into the practitioner world through that translation. But in addition to that, um, it then created a platform for other kinds of policy implications, including work that I've now done with leading governance experts in Canada on a whole new set of guidelines for board governance as a result of this. So the, uh, the, the work that I've been doing is really the translational work of taking research out into the world of, of practice. Great, Th thanks very much. Uh, and Srinivas, tell us about your, your work, please. Thanks, Andrew. Really pleased to be with uh, all of you and uh, really pleased that all of you uh, are here. Without you, it's no fun at all. So uh, uh, I'm a faculty member in the marketing area at the University of Vermont. And as part of my research program, I study entrepreneurship in context of poverty. So whenever we hear the word entrepreneurship, it conjures up images of uh, entrepreneurs like uh, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. But most entrepreneurs in the world live in contexts of poverty, are often in poverty themselves, and run survivalist enterprises to meet basic consumption needs in low-income communities around the world. But we know very little about the lives and contextual realities of these entrepreneurs. So that's been the focus of my research over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, the particular project that uh, won the award was work that I did with 25 women entrepreneurs in a large uh, urban low-income community in South India. I tracked these women entrepreneurs over a period of five years with one month of field work uh, every December. And uh, what really came out of this research is how these women were using entrepreneurship as a site to transform their own lives for the better. I'd like to start with uh, the voices of my informant. So one of my informant, she runs a bottle pickle business. And uh, she makes a net income of $10 per month running her business, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, even in that context. So I asked her, why do you run this business for just $10? To which she said, this is the first time I have money in my hands that I can spend in any way of my own choosing. I don't have to rely on my husband to buy chocolate for my children. It's changed the way I look at myself and what I think I'm capable of, right? So it, uh, if we remain focused only on the monetary outcomes, we lose much of what is transformational in her life. The second question I asked her was, why bottle pickle business? Why not some other business? To which she said, uh, when I told my husband I want to start a business, he said, I don't want you to start a business because you'll become arrogant and start talking back to me, right? So what she had to deal with is not just the constraints of poverty, but subordination in a strong patriarchal uh, society. She didn't have the uh, luxury of rebellion. Uh, so she was able to negotiate with him and say that I'll run this bottle pickle business because it's from within the threshold of uh, the home. And he feels like he's still in charge. And over the five years that I uh, worked with her, uh, slowly, he saw what she was capable of doing and she was selling in the broader neighborhood. So it's slow moving transformations uh, that the paper captures. It talks about uh, uh, theoretically the notion of uh, negotiated agency. Uh, but the key thing for us is uh, going from this insight to transformative impact. So we said if it's uh, possible that these women are using entrepreneurship as a site to uh, transform their own lives, can we spur the process by creating entrepreneurship? 
entrepreneurial education program. So we created a three-day entrepreneurial education program, uh, assuming that people cannot read and write. So it's very uh, image-oriented, dialogue-oriented, community-centric education program. We recruited about 600 women entrepreneurs across several villages in South India, all from low-income communities. And uh, treatment group, control group, we provided education to both groups, but we measured important well-being related variables like women's empowerment, consumption of well-being enhancing products and goods. And what we found was it really moves the needle on some of these important um, women's empowerment related indicators. For example, mobility. Earlier, I would never leave the home, but now I go to the weekly village market, which is 10 kilometers away. Earlier, I would never be consulted when purchasing things for the house, but now my inputs are always considered. So uh, the research has spanned about uh, seven, eight years. We are still working on, on the data from the randomized control trial. Uh, but it captures uh, you know, my approach to working in uh, entrepreneurial communities far away from our own shores where well-being is really under threat and examining how we can unearth grounded insights to uh, craft uh, interventions that are that bring about transformative outcomes i'll stop there thank you so much so so thank you all some 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 very inspiring and interesting and varied um research projects i, I mean so a first question perhaps to, to all of you perhaps i'll just go around but but um you know it sounds very basic but really what motivates you and how important is it that the work that you're all doing has you know, touches on pressing societal issues and perhaps, amongst others, aligns with the sustainable development goals. D Daniel, first, briefly. Andrew, I think this is a, a really good question, and it's not necessarily an easy question. It's not a question that has the same answer every day or for every project. Um, but I do think the, the policy relevance motivates me a lot. Um, so I had a background before getting into academic work and before even going to grad school as a uh, policy analyst for a state government trying to look at the costs of fiscal programs and basic fiscal policy. And I remember thinking there's so much evidence out here about very general stuff. There's a lot of theory. There's a lot of kind of kind of broad scale evidence, but there's not a lot as much evidence as we would have liked to give advice to policymakers on kind of a policy by policy, moment by moment including a, a small a small different piece of a policy that, that kind of could could really speak to making the policy uh, more data driven taking into account the the welfare implications of more types of people um, there wasn't a lot of that sort of information out there in the academic literature because the academic literature is very very focused on uh, big and academic questions. Um, and so I know uh, Mark may mention more about this um, but I think to me I really like, knowing that someone somewhere that is not academic has used my research a little bit. Um, and so I think, yes, the, the, the work on the nature of ESG positions in banks has been something that I've gotten to talk with a lot of state legislators around the U.S. about. And just, uh, I think I'll, I'll only say one outside of the U.S. so far, um, because the anti-ESG movement, of course, has been a, a lot in the U.S. Um, but so I think that that, that is definitely something that, that I take a lot of uh, pride in, the fact that someone who's not academic read some of my, my work. Okay. okay. Bouncing around a bit. Sarah, maybe next. What's your, you know, how important is it to you to have this SDG alignment and societal impact in your work? I mean, it's very important. And I mean, just to picking up off of where Daniel left off, this idea of this iteration between the conversations you have with the people, the practitioners, the people who are trying to, to make this work and the research that we do is so important. And you know, a lot of research questions have come from to me from those interactions and from writing my book and trying to make that make those ideas legible and then going to the research and finding where there were gaps in the research and then doing more research myself to start filling those gaps and encouraging others to do research to fill those gaps. So that iteration, I think, is incredibly important. I also think scholarly work is is really important because so much policy is made based on very bad data. And, um, you know, they do a consultation, everyone has five minutes to say something, and then they make a policy. And so I think there's real value in the rigor that we have in scholarly research, the peer review process, everything that we do to try to really find careful results is so important, including where it debunks, you know, various ideas. Um, I think it's important to speak truth to power, not in a gotcha way. I think there's some people who are 
trying to make a career of, you know, gotcha research, you know, that says, oh, really diversity on boards doesn't lead to performance. Well, it's a mixed and complicated story. We don't need to tell a gotcha story. We just need to tell a truth story. And I think if we focus on the science of it, we can actually really contribute um, to policymaking in a very meaningful way. Thanks. Uh, Srinivas, what, what motivates you and how important is it? Uh, uh, the motivation comes from uh, the voices from the field. To give you an example, I work in a subsistence fishing community, and the way of life in the community has been for hundreds of years. Uh, when you're eight years old, you get on the boat, you uh, learn the ropes on how to navigate the sea, uh, go to a particular location in, uh, in the sea using certain wind and catch certain kind of fish. But if you talk to community members now, they will say that the character of the sea has completely changed. You go to the same place, same time uh, in the year, and you don't catch the fish that your ancestors and your know, grandfather, father used to catch, right? So traditional wisdom in many of these communities have stopped working. And when they tell you stories like this, uh, that's really the starting point for the research. And I've really uh, enjoyed being in a discipline business, which is uh, uh, which allows us to uh, borrow toolkits, both methodological as well as theoretical toolkits, from different areas to address these real-world problems related to uh, the marketplace. So I think the motivation comes from well-being challenges faced by people at the ground level. It's not an abstract discussion about climate change. It's something that a vulnerable community is already experiencing, and then thinking about what we can do by drawing from our disciplines toolkit to uh, address the problem and move the needle at the ground level. Thanks, Mark, what about you? Yeah, so I think the question can be answered in potentially two ways. Um, there's a general question as to why do this type of research and the more specific, why do the child abuse research? As to the general point, I just don't see how we can morally justify not engaging with the kind of questions to which the answers can actually have a positive effect on real people living in really difficult situations, particularly from the privilege from which we write and, and make our own decisions. But leaving aside this moral imperative, you know, life is short and you know, it's important to try and look after each other as best we can, you know, uh, particularly in a world that is so very dark and depressing at the moment. And, and leaving that aside, I mean, at the end of the day, so many of us, you know, our salaries are derived in part from the taxpayer. And I don't think, we, I don't think we pause, pause enough, I think, at, at the value that we give in turn to the people that are actually allowing us to do what we do and enjoy the freedoms that we have. As to the specific question, I'm going to give you a very cryptic answer. It only occurred to me recently that maybe our research chooses us more than we choose it, if that makes sense, right? And so, particularly in the field work, so I've, I've worked in difficult communities for almost 20 years now, and mostly living uh, with small groups of people trying to do really difficult things. And, and it's often only with hindsight that you realize why you were attracted to doing a certain piece of research. And so without saying too much, I mean, looking at this child abuse, I, uh, it was only once I'd started this, I came to see why I probably was involved and the reasons um, and how much abuse there is, including very, very close to our own families. So yeah, it's curious, but, but that's probably the specific um, research question. Thanks, a powerful testimony. So I'd like to turn to kind of different forms of output. Um, Srinivas, I mean, you, you, you sort of part started to answer this question because, you know, one form of output and impact is clearly through teaching. Um, just tell us briefly, you know, your thoughts on, on methods to disseminate to whether it's directly formal students within the business school or indeed the wider communities directly? You know, what are, what's, how important is that and what ways are most effective to disseminate your insights? No, oh, it's absolutely uh, critical. And uh, what I find is something that really works in the classroom is uh, if we uh, adopt the use of art in capturing uh, life circumstances and contextual realities in the communities where you work and bring that in, into the classroom so that the discussion is not just at the abstract level, but people can engage with the human stories behind these abstract issues like climate change. So for example, uh, something that I do uh, in my classroom, I teach a course on developing products and solutions for low income markets. And uh, I arrange a, a conference call with fishers in a small subsistence community with my students 
where they directly interact with uh, the fishers, learn about what problems they are uh, facing. So it's not just about talking about the paper and frameworks uh, from our research, but getting out of the way and creating those uh, connections to the extent possible. And uh, there's no app, uh, substitute for actual immersion in these communities, right? So uh, uh, in the absence of that, if people are unable to travel, I work with a lot of local artists, photographers, painters, uh, documentary makers to capture lived realities in these communities so that we can um, bring these far-flung uh, areas around the world into the classroom. Uh, I find that to be very powerful, thanks. And Sarah, you talked at the start about your precisely writing a book for practitioners. Any other thoughts on effective ways to, you know, to generate and share insights? Yes, well, obviously, when uh, it's so important, we as educators are educating the next generation of leaders. And so building in these ideas into their education is really crucial. And so much like Srinivas, uh, I try to immerse my students. I send them out on ethnographic visits. Like for example, when, sometimes I teach this course and I just look at Walmart for the entire course. And so students go to Walmarts and they do these things. And, and um, I have role-playing in the classroom, you know, things that again, create the emotional linkage to some of these ideas and get them to really work on the tough challenges. Uh, and, you know, the book actually came out of these conversations with the students about these tough challenges and the questions that they were asking me. And so one of the things that I think about a lot is how can we get students to move away from here's what you have to learn and regurgitate on a test to what questions, what are your research questions? What are the questions that you really want to go out into the world with? And so that's a way that I've been um, thinking about moving these ideas from this is what you should know to this is how you want to think about knowing. Sure. And Mark, what about your thoughts in terms of how you managed to integrate your research and insights into teaching? Uh, I really like what uh, Srinivas was saying earlier on about bringing photography and film footage into the classroom, which is exactly what I do. So I might bring film footage from my time in Afghanistan, you know, um, in the field hospital in the classroom or time on the Amazon. And even though the worlds that I show the students are very different from the worlds they experience, um, it, it provides a very safe space in some sense to try and draw inferences from what they see. And a lot of what I teach is effectively on how to collaborate more effectively with other people, very much like yourself often in very challenging situations or how to negotiate yourself out of conflict. And because I see conflict quite a lot, you know, and I'm able to documented sometimes in film and, and photography. Um, I bring it into the classroom and it's it's, um, it's it's a very effective, but also quite a fun way to, to get people to be emotionally moved by what they see and to respond sometimes quite viscerally to it. And then engage them into a more reflexive exercise. And so, um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I love field work. I don't think I could be an academic if I weren't allowed to spend a lot of my time outside of the university. <laughs> working with real people, you know, so, um, and there are really good ways, I think, to bring it back into the classroom. I also, by the way, really like what you said, Sarah, about focusing on Walmart and getting students to go into Walmart and so on. I mean, that's kind of where it's at, you know, in education. It's, it's you know, we're no longer in a classroom where, you know, professors share wisdom, you know, with a group of hungry kids. You know, we are dealing with kids that are are you know satiated by social media and we just need to get them out there properly and get them to see how other people live their lives and to help them generate some of this empathy and i think it's so important you know this empathy and instill some sense of doubt that actually there are multiple ways to live a good life a meaningful life not just one way and there are real people facing problems that are very different from our own you know but there might be things we might be able to do to help i think this enriching experience that's kind of what education is all about you know you need to Get, get kids out there, you know, or otherwise get the other worlds into the classroom as best we can, so. Sure, Daniel? Not really fair to follow all of that. Um, I, I, so I, as a, a relatively, uh, I'll say newer 
teacher and, and, and kind of the education I have, I think I don't have too much to add to this other than saying that I, I really agree with what Mark said about finding students who find themselves already satiated by social media and other things and the way they experience the world that offering new experiences and, and is, is going to be really helpful. But I haven't actually found a personally a very helpful way of doing that yet. Um, so in terms of helping get get research to students, this is something I've, I've been trying to have other junior academics come in or record short videos on how their research is impacting people. But uh, I'll, I'll take myself more as a learner here than than someone who has the, the real insights about how to make this work best. That's fine. I'm, I'm shifting now to some questions from from uh, those who are watching. Do please post any more. Uh, there's an interesting quantitative one here, as it were, for anybody. Um, how to link your specific research or work to the SDGs? And are you able to use any specific targets or indicators to measure impact? Anyone got any experience or thoughts on that? Raise your hand or start speaking. Yes, Mark. Uh, so this is kind of a non-answer. I mean, measuring impact is really, really hard. And of course, there's a temptation that we end up doing the kind of meaningful research of which the impact can actually be easily measured and thereby not doing the kind of research where impact is actually hard to measure. So as an ethnographer, I work with very small samples and I, can quant I can't quantify, but I can speak to some of the impact. But when it comes to very hard measurements, it's really, really complex. And I think we need to be very, very careful not to be tempted to only go for measurable, meaningful impact. Um, so yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question, but it's, I find it a very, very tough one. So I will admit to being defeated on this point to some extent. Maybe should have, should have asked it. Uh, just wanted to, uh, no, I'll add more complexity. So, uh, uh, the way impact measurement is generally talked about is, uh, did it work or not? Right, so it's more seen more as a validation, but most of uh, you know what I've heard from folks on this panel is uh, their work is a long-term uh, relational engagement in several communities where well-being is at threat. Right, so uh, we should think of impact not as did it work or not, but think about it more as a process of continuous learning. Uh, that I think is uh, really crucial. To give you an example, I told you about the uh, work that we did with women entrepreneurs providing them education programs. It did move the needle on empowerment related indicators, but uh, uh, anytime you flatten power hierarchies, there's also backlash. So spousal undermining uh, went up as you could have uh, you know, uh, guessed. So uh, being embedded within the context uh, allows us to be accountable for those things and see how we can uh, integrate the men as well in the education program, right? So I would think about impact not as a validation, but more as a process of continuous uh, improvement. And, there, and there's perhaps an interesting, oh, sorry, Sarah, please go in, come in. I 100% I, I agree with my colleagues. I think that that's exactly the way we should be thinking about impact, but I hear um, Rahul who asked the question, you know, there is a world out there where people are obsessed with measurement and are being, measurement is being forced down the throats of these communities that, you know, you're talking about and you're engaging with. And so I, and, and there is some value in measurement, like, you know, let's not do interventions that don't work, you know, um, but it is, it's very tricky. And so I hear that question coming from this, uh, uh, you know, obsession with measurement and how many organizations out there trying to do the work that you're describing are spending so much of their time creating measures. And I, so I just want to say, I think what your answers really highlight for me is that, you know, what is the challenge of measuring when the work that we're doing really requires this deep engagement, this unfolding over time. You know, with my work, sometimes I don't know if it's having an impact until I see someone do an op-ed in the Globe and Mail that basically uses my ideas and change, you know, has changed the conversation on some topic like, you know, the care economy. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've had impact, but would I be able to measure that? So I think it's just this question of measurement is very tricky, but I understand, I have empathy for where it's coming from. Yeah, and dare I say, even an op-ed doesn't mean necessarily that changes practice, right? It's just one level further of a of a public debate. But 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 going to, I mean, this links into a couple of the other remarks we've got in here. So, and Mohsen says um, it may be necessary for us to be more creative and innovative in in establishing new awards 
for impactful research. And incidentally, one of the reasons we launched at the FT are responsible business education awards was precisely because a lot of this does need to be more qualitative and individualistic rather than simply being possible to distill into into very succinct metrics. Um, does, so does anyone have any thoughts on actually what how one might modify or nuance or increase the number of awards that try to assess and showcase and hopefully incentivize more impactful research? Any thoughts on that? What would be your preferred categories if you had the, uh, the options? Daniel? I don't know if I have a preferred category, but I want to, to note that um, well, research is hard and uh, it's, it's easier to award research after it's been done than before it's been done. But I think it would be, as a, as a junior academic, if we thought about awards that were geared toward anything that you can help that can help the research be created in the first place instead of ex post stepping in um, is always going to be a potentially helpful thing. I, lo I love the idea of things that, that are going to help PhD students develop agendas that are focused on things that matter and maybe focused on the, the, the accessibility or, or the, the success of the, the SDGs or um, uh, because people people come uh, uh, kind of get get over time they become uh, in, ingrained in their own little research agenda and these agendas change over time and morph over time but the earlier you can start someone and say hey hey we think you have this agenda about so some development goal and say that this does matter and we want to support that from the beginning um, I think that is one idea that you can make the award also impactful by by helping create impactful research from the beginning and just to understand that, Daniel, so you, so you ideally you might, let's say, like a, a reward, an award at the time in which a research project has first been conceptualized. Yeah, a reward for the proposal of the project uh, instead of a, a reward for the outcome of the project. Uh, many, many, also I should note, many projects do have null results. Um, and many times you look into something and it's it is hard to have impact when you say, I went in to measure a thing and I thought there was going to be a cool intervention and it didn't work. Um, and I do think that even kind of taking the award and separating it from the results and say that just this is a good question to ask and this is a good way of going about it. I'm um, really excited to hear the answer. Um, I mean, it can put a lot of pressure on someone, so maybe it's a bad idea, but I'm just thinking again, innovative ideas, maybe outside the box. I'll just yeah. add to that, that basically that's sort of a grant like that you would give for research. And so maybe uh, elevating the importance of these grants and, and particularly like the kind of research that Srinivas is describing or Mark is describing, this is incredibly expensive research that takes years. And so, you know, more than giving awards, I think the grant giving, the resource providing, um, and the guidance that might come with that, that might be a more important way to go than, I mean, it's lovely to have my book awarded, but honestly, that it's that's less important to me than I think it would be for a junior scholar to get money to actually do this important research and to have that vote of confidence that this is important. I suppose the wider issue here, sorry, Mark, yeah, please do come in. Uh, thanks, Andrea. I, I think, I mean, just building on what Sarah and what Srinivas and, and well, actually, as an example, but Daniel just said, um, I think that what's for junior faculty, very, very difficult as well as for PhD students is the fact that they don't have a lot of time and they're very risk averse, right? And so they know that they have to come out on the market with some currency, which is some publication that has some merit and gets them a job. They realize that the PhD will typically consist of three papers that are relatively easily converted into publishable papers. They realize that fieldwork is virtually a no, no, is a no go zone because it's just too high risk is ethically too compromising, too difficult, too complex, and it will take too long, you know. And yet many of the issues that, you know, business schools say they want to incentivize, you know, which have to do with these global development goals, these, these are kind of very challenging situations, they require people to take risk. And it's almost impossible to see how junior faculty and PCs can do it. You know, and then the assumption is, well, just wait till you get tenure. And once you get tenure, you can do whatever you want to do. Well, the problem is, of course, is by the time you get tenure, you've built a particular reputation for yourself. You set out your stall. And the expectation is you do more of the same thing. And I can't really think of anyone who's gotten tenure and then suddenly changed tack. And it's something that's really significant, you know. And so in some ways, you know, my heart goes out to a PC students coming in, you know, wanting to do important work, but being told more or less that actually at the end of the day, you know, you uh, you play the game, <laughs> um, 
and you accumulate your currency. And then once you get tenured, you can kind of do what you want and it never happens. So we're working in a system that actually isn't ideal, frankly, you know, for people to go and do meaningful work. And, and that would be my my final sort of round of questions, actually, building on Mark's point. I mean, what do the, each of you think about the the structural barriers that exist at the moment within and around academia that that, that, that narrow the focus, that stress perhaps high impact multiple publication at the expense of outreach and and implementation of ideas and so on? What what might be the one or two key things that you would call for if it was possible to, to change the system or at least to increase the motivations and incentives for your sort of research? Sri do you want to go? Uh, I think Daniel was just about to set, so I'll let Daniel. Uh, no, I was just going to ask for clarification on the order. Let's uh... go. You go ahead, Daniel, if you want. <laughs> well, I, I uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm uh, of the four of us closest to having received my PhD. I think there are a lot of structural barriers, and there's a huge amount of privilege that goes into earning a PhD and sitting down and writing your three papers and having the choice of saying what those three papers are about and then the experience you bring to writing those three papers. I mean, there's there's a huge amount. Um, my, I had a wonderful development economist as my undergraduate thesis advisor. Her name was Patricia Toledo. Um, and she uh, told me that it is possible to succeed in a PhD and many, many people can do research. And, and most people who can do research don't wind up doing it. Has the, the the barrier of saying, I can get through this this perseverance test. I can uh, sit and go to the library every day for six years and do a little bit of reading every day and a little bit of writing every day. That setting your life aside for those six years and maybe the first few years before it in doing your your kind of predoctoral work or whatever. Um, that having the privilege to do that is really wild. Um, and so you, you set up a barrier where in, in order to get to ask the questions you want to ask and the questions I want to ask are probably not the same questions that everyone else in the room wants to ask. I think we're, we're all individual individual agents. And so only a, a very small select of people who want to do research wind up getting through all of those hoops. And I do think it, it really fundamentally changes the research that we wind up producing. Um, I don't have all the answers on how you do that better. Um, I, I, uh, all, all I know is that it's, it's uh, a privilege to be able to write the research I want to write. Um, and that's, that's, I'll, I'll leave it to maybe some people who have been around a little longer to, to give the, the real advice here. We've, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So really in 30 seconds a piece, Srinivas, any thoughts? Uh, if I could just flip the question and talk about some positive changes that I'm already seeing. I think 10 years back, it would have been much harder to do this kind of work. So I think it's, uh, um, and thanks to some of the work that folks in this panel are doing and others. So it's getting better. Uh, for sure. And I think we are in a di uh, discipline that uh, adopts multidisciplinarity, allows us to draw from multiple uh, places, including uh, development economics. That's a very positive uh, aspect of our uh, discipline as compared to others that tend to be in their own silos. So I think there are lots of positive aspects as well. Uh, Sarah? I agree. And I would also um, just say that I think a lot of students come in very motivated these days by these kinds of issues. And the challenge for them is to, to learn to be a scientist, to learn to be a scholar, to learn to have that analytical stance and not the advocacy stance, because there's a great space for advocacy. But the role, the valuable role that we can play is one of the scientists who really is trying to get to the truth. And I think that's a that's a hard transition for people who really want to do the advocacy. Um, but I agree that there's a lot more space for it these days. And Mark, final word? Wow. OK. Um, I think to focus on developing supportive communities around our PhD students and junior faculty and being a little bit more patient with work that's actually very hard to do and turning our focus less on the type of publications people have, sort of type of journals that are walking around the conference room and more on the ideas that people are very trying to work on as best as they can, um, which is what the intellectual community should be about, you know, so. Well, very good. Well, look, very, very, very helpful thoughts. An awful lot of um, challenges, but but it's great to see that that you and many of your colleagues are doing excellent work in this area. And I think important discussing impact not only in terms of 
policy and practice, as it were, but also in terms of education, probably arguably the greatest impact that um, many scholars can, can have, whether through their own students in the classroom or indeed the wider community, including the, as it were, those that you've been studying in the world beyond um, universities. So thank you all for your for your work. Congratulations again for your, your awards. Thanks everyone for listening. I think hopefully the transcript or a summary will be available afterwards for everybody. And let's keep this uh, dialogue and momentum and debate uh, going. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was an inspirational session. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Great. Thank you, you're going to you'll, you'll circulate the summaries after, will you? Or, yeah, yes, uh, we, we have the Great. recording and everything. It's oh, going good. to be on the website. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.